Sanders, a postdoc at uh, the UW Personal Robotics Lab. She completed her PhD at UT Austin with Professor Thomas, and now she's been uh, she's been working there on HRI and like uh, robot learning. And yeah, we're we're glad to have you here with us, Taylor, and uh, and uh, hope you like the experience of today's talk. And I think I can have you share the screen and start. Uh, presenting now. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited to, to talk about this. Um, and yeah, so kind of the, the big uh, point, can everyone see my screen now? Is that sharing? Well, awesome. Um, so yeah, the, the, the big point of my talk today is uh, all about enabling robots to adapt to real people and learn from them. Um, I, you know, from our poll results, we can see that that quite a few people have interacted with social robots, but not had a fantastic experience with them. And that's something that I want to help change in the future. So, um, so robots, in order to be deployed in dynamic and varied environments like homes and public spaces or used as caregivers, robots should be able to adapt uh, and learn, especially with the people around them. So while they're in the wild, robots have access to so many different kinds of data. They have input from their sensors, they have input from the humans around them. And we want them to be able to leverage all of the information at their disposal, including that human information that they have. However, human data can be noisy, particularly when it's acquired from non-experts. So if we want our robots learning from real people, they're probably gonna interact with a wide variety. So some might be experts at teaching robots, but others might not have any prior experience at all. And that means that robots are not going to get perfect information in large quantities. So rather than requiring expert teachers or trying to get more and more data out of people, which is expensive, um, what I've worked on is trying to address methods for learning from imperfect human teachers and trying to do that in, in smaller and smaller quantities. So for example, let's consider a scenario where a robot just arrives at somebody's house. The robot has some knowledge going in, but it wants to learn some new skills too. There's lots of different ways that a robot can learn from a human in the environment. There's learning from demonstration, learning from advice, learning from feedback, tons of subcategories within those. So I'm gonna focus for this talk and on my work uh, with human in the loop reinforcement learning or HRL. So in this case, let's say the robot is learning how to set a table by trying out actions and then getting a reaction from the person. In a perfect scenario, the person living in the house will be able to observe it the entire time that it's learning how to set the table. And they'll give perfect feedback to the robot. They'll let it know immediately when it's done something wrong or when it's done something right. However, life isn't perfect and there's gonna be a lot of noise in the data that the robot is In a home environment out in the wild, there's going to be plenty of distractions for the person teaching the robot. There's going to be other chores for them to do, times when they can't be at home, and they might just get bored after spending an hour teaching a robot. In this case, they might be inattentive, only paying attention to the robot intermittently. When this happens, they will be watching the robot or giving feedback when it's potentially most useful to the robot's learning process. Another option is they might misunderstand the task, what the robot's asking, what the robot's capabilities are, and these kind of incorrect assumptions can lead to them giving incorrect feedback to the learning robot. If the robot gets incorrect feedback during the learning process, it will take longer to learn the task or maybe never even learn the task at all. So because of these issues, what my research is focused on is learning robot policies um, from these human teachers, incorrect, imperfect human teachers. And what my work does is uh, I try to show that algorithms that actively modify which states receive feedback from imperfect and unmodeled human teachers can improve both the speed and dependability of HRL. And when I talk about speed, I'm talking about how long it takes for a robot to learn a task, how many episodes, learning episodes it takes. When I talk about dependability, I'm talking about algorithms that are robust to a wide variance of input qualities. And what's nice about HRL is it gives a robot a reward function and input from human teachers. And what this does is it provides a an alternative to full demonstrations from inexperienced human teachers, where it might be difficult for them to give 
these full teleop door demonstrated uh, demonstrations to the robot. And then the problem formulation of human in the loop reinforcement learning gives us two forms of input, that reward function and the human input, and they can be used to supplement and verify each other. So I'm going to do a quick coverage of the basics, uh, covering uh, Markov decision processes, reinforcement learning, and some baseline HRL algorithms. The reinforcement learning lets a an agent learn from interacting with its environment based on an MDP, Markov decision process. So we'll continue with this example that our agent's goal is to learn how to set the table. It's currently learning to put the fork to the left of the plate. In an MDP, the state of this environment can be the position of all the items on the table, and the robot's possible actions could be putting the fork in one of four different possible places on the table. Our transition function gives the probabilities of transitioning between these different states, and then the reward function gives rewards to robots based on the last state action pair that they made. For the research that I'm talking about today, I'm using the Q-learning reinforcement learning algorithm, which updates the Q values of each state action pair based on observed rewards using a Bellman update, which is uh, shown up above. The Q value reflects the expected future reward of transitioning into any given state. And once these values are calculated, the robot can take actions that lead to higher calculated Q values. Now, reinforcement learning can be slow and it can easily get temporarily stuck in local optima while it's learning. One way that learning agents can get around this problem is to explore the state space rather than exploiting what it knows is the current highest valued action. You might be able to find a higher valued action somewhere else. So there should be some randomness involved in the next action that the robot takes instead of always just taking the action that has the highest Q value because there might be higher rewards that the robot has yet to discover. So while this can help over time, what HRL does is it uses a human in the loop to push the agent out of local optima more quickly because the teacher can be aware of the global structure of the task and help the robot out of these local optima. So HRL can let uh, people give feedback in several different ways. One way is having human feedback replace a reward function entirely, um, like in the original Tamer algorithm by Knox and Stone, where the agent learns from feedback instead of rewards. So our person completely replaces the reward function. So even if there isn't that reward function that's been defined by an expert, the supervising human can give feedback after watching actions. And those numbers are interpreted as reward for the robot. Being able to give these kind of scalar values as feedback lets people be really specific about the quality of the actions that they're observing. However, giving scalar valued rewards directly can sometimes be intuitive, unintuitive for people. It's not always obvious how to scale the numerical feedback to the robot. For example, say the robot takes a good action. How much numerical praise does that action deserve? One, 10, 100? So to address this, several works in HRL scale feedback from teachers to binary positive or negative feedback on agents' actions. My thesis work is closely related to one of the algorithms that uses binary feedback, policy shaping. Policy shaping allows the robot to learn both from a reward function and from a human teacher, as we discussed. So using policy shaping, the teacher can give binary positive or negative feedback on the actions that the robot takes. In this algorithm, the feedback that the user gives influences the policy of the robot rather than directly acting as a reward to the robot. I chose policy shaping as the baseline algorithm for a lot of my research because A, this algorithm doesn't require scalar feedback from a user, so the user just has to identify whether an action is good or bad, or neither. And then it also uses both an environmental reward function and human feedback, so we have kind of a system of checks and balances. So if one of those is wrong, we can check on in on the other. To use policy shaping with Q-learning, um, the algorithm starts with Boltzmann, uh, the Boltzmann exploration equation, uh, often used in reinforcement learning. Based on the Q values of state action pairs, this equation controls how the robot explores while it's learning. This equation introduces some of that randomness that I was talking about into the robot's chosen actions so that the robot doesn't always take the action that it currently thinks is bad. In policy shaping, it's also calculated how likely each action should be based on feedback from the teacher, as well as from that Boltzmann exploration equation. 
um, policy shaping formula shown here, where C is a trust parameter between zero and one, which is set by an expert based on how accurate the teacher's feedback is expected to be. For example, if the teacher is expected to be mostly accurate, C can be set to a high number like 0.9. If the teacher is expected to be mostly inaccurate, C can be set lower under 0.5. And when it's set to 0.5, it just collapses to plain old reinforcement learning without a human teacher. This policy shaping equation also accounts for potential inconsistencies in the human's input using this uh, delta function here. Delta is the difference between the number of positive and negative feedbacks given by the teacher for each state action pair. So if the teacher isn't consistent with their feedback on specific actions or they change their mind over time, policy shaping will eventually account for this inconsistency. Then policy shaping combines the first two equations. And this final equation combining both the information from the reinforcement learning algorithm and from the human's feedback influences the robot's policy or the actions that it chooses to take while it's learning. Policy shaping can speed up reinforcement learning because the teacher is pushing the robot in the right direction, hopefully towards the, the goal behavior. Now, kind of spinning off from just this basic interactive reinforcement learning, I want to quickly talk about my first foray into learning from imperfect teachers. So while learning about policy shaping and other similar algorithms, I noticed that again and again, this work was expecting someone to be available whenever the robot needed feedback. That's great, but what does it mean if the robot asks for feedback and there's no one there to provide it, so the robot doesn't hear anything back from a human teacher? How should the robot interpret that silence? If the teacher is always paying attention, then Cedarborg et al. Found, et al found that in some cases, silence should be interpreted as positive. So that is, the robot should accept no input as tacit approval of its current policy. However, it can be wrong to interpret silence as positive feedback if the teacher is not there or not paying attention. So say the robot places the fork in the wrong spot on the table then it's going to take the lack of feedback from the teacher who's gone and didn't see the action as positive feedback, which is incorrect. So many human in the loop reinforcement learning algorithms assume that a teacher's present whenever the robot wants more information. It's probably not going to be true in the real world. Most people are going to get tired or bored or distracted and want to take a break from them. So in order to address how the robot should behave differently when teachers are or are not paying attention, we created the Attention Modified Policy Shaping Algorithm, or AMPS. AMPS enables robots to take advantage of human feedback while teachers are present, um, but also behave a little bit more predictably while they're gone. While teachers are present, AMPS exploits their presence. Oh, that uh, citation got really big. Oh, there you go. There it is. <laughs> While a teacher is present, AMPS exploits their presence by exploring more. We do this by having the robot take two kinds of actions, one that the person hasn't seen before and actions that the person has responded positively to in the past. Taking unseen actions if one is available allows the robot to get feedback on new areas of the state space. Taking good previously approved actions takes the robot to potentially better areas of the state space because the final goal is to find a path of feature approved actions to a goal. Now, without attention from a teacher, the robot takes previously approved actions whenever one's available. This keeps the robot from exploring new and unknown areas of the state space when possible to act a little bit more conservatively and predictably when no teachers are watching. So much like leaving child alone, we'd like the robot to take unsurprising, hopefully safe actions while it's unobserved, rather than trying new things and exploring. In a human study that we conducted, uh, the experimenters alerted the robot when the users were present and when they were gone. So note here that the, we're, we're not focusing on how robots can detect attention, we're just focusing on what the robots should do when there is attention and when there isn't. So we told the robot when the teachers were there and when they were gone. The robot was learning how to push a cup in a discrete state space towards a goal location, which it's kind of small, but there's a green X in the center of the table up front. So it's trying to push the cup from the back of the table towards the front center. So here we can see the robot exploring less without attention. So no teacher is there and it's received some feedback in the past and it knows how to kind of get to that goal location. 
um, you can see me there uh, darting in to reset the, the cup to the original position so the robot can keep learning. Now, when the person is there, um, the robot wants to explore more, see if it can find even a, a better reward than it has in the past. Um, and it has that person there to give it feedback. So it's trying these new actions, and then the person's there to prevent catastrophe, which is the cup falling off of the table. We also ran experiments in simulation with that same task. With a simulated teacher giving intermittent feedback, we found that AMPS was able to learn more quickly than policy shaping. On this graph here, the, the shaded areas, those the green backgrounds, indicate the presence of attention. And we can see that the rewards gathered by AMPS spike during inattentive periods because it's trying to stick to good actions, which generally lead to better rewards. Performance drops during attention periods during these shaded backgrounds because it's trying new things. But we can see that it learns quite a bit during these periods, given the large spike after the shaded areas. So the positives of this algorithm are that AMPS was able to learn quickly and gather more rewards over time than policy shaping was, and it was able to take advantage of the feedback that it received from teachers. So that's a quick overview of how I got into the idea of learning from imperfect teachers, and this kind of um, inspired the rest of my, my PhD, my thesis that I worked on with Andrew Thomas. And the idea of inattentive uh, teachers was very interesting to me, but I also soon became much more interested in how robots could learn if the information they were receiving from people was actually incorrect, not just intermittent. And this line of thought leads us to uh, my most recent work, which helped me finish out my PhD and is continuing in my postdoc at UW. So some prior algorithms in HRL, um, like we mentioned, include policy shaping, um, there's Tamer, which we, we uh, kind of breezed through before, which lets a, a person replace the reward function instead of just supplementing it. Um, future work from, from Tamer by Knox and Stone um, introduced Tamer plus RL, which is another method of combining rewards and human feedback. So these are kind of my baseline algorithms that I'm looking at for this work on incorrect human teachers. So in policy shaping, like we said, C is this trust parameter set between zero and one. And then the Tamer plus RL methods are both ways of combining H of SA, which is that learn human reward function with the learn Q values from an environmental reward function. So as we can see here, all three algorithms here assign some form of trust to the teacher or weight to the teacher's feedback. So that would come from C in policy shaping, and then P and W are both sort of weights on how much weight we want to put on the teacher's input versus the reward function when you're learning from Tamer plus RL. <laughs> so note that these uh, trust or weight variables function well if feedback is randomly bad. So no matter the state, the teachers say P percent likely to give good feedback. In general, what our insight was is that it's unlikely that people will just randomly give the robot bad feedback. Instead, they're going to give bad feedback based on a misunderstanding of the task or how the robot works, which means that we can exploit these patterns to learn which parts of the task state space will consistently receive bad feedback and which ones will consistently receive good feedback or correct feedback. Algorithms like policy shaping also assume that the skill of the teacher is kind of a known prior. This variable C has to be set before learning begins based on how much the teacher's feedback should be trusted. Other algorithms that account for incorrect teacher feedback use the assumption that feedback is mostly correct or mostly incorrect. And however, the robot often has no knowledge about the quality of feedback before learning begins. There's also a good deal of work that avoids randomness, learns on the fly, but it takes demonstrations rather than feedback. Demonstrations can be difficult for inexperienced teachers to provide, especially when you're trying to translate from human arm motions for manipulation to a weird seven-jointed robotic arm that's trying to perform the same task. So this leads me to some of my work on learning from incorrect human teachers. Um, so this is the, the CLEAR algorithm. In CLEAR, we use an online learning classifier, C, to predict whether a reinforcement learning curve is predicted to rise or fall based on the observed state action pairs in a trajectory. 
This information is combined with the environmental reward function, which we do assume to be correct, to filter binary feedback from teachers. And the predictions from our classifier are used to determine whether to keep, invert, or discard feedback. I'm going to start with a, just a quick example of how this environmental reward works. Um, so just looking at the, the cumulative reward for an example trajectory. Um, say these red states indicate danger zones that the agent should stay away from. We have a trajectory where the agent gets rewards negative 1 all the way through and then negative 10 when it hits a danger zone. Then the trajectory ends. That gives us a cumulative reward of negative 14. And then another sample trajectory, this time successful, the robot steps through until it reaches the goal, getting a reward of 5. So that kind of explains how we're looking at these cumulative rewards, and these cumulative rewards are getting plotted over time so that we can see whether the cumulative rewards are rising or falling as we learn. So our classifier here um, takes in state features and actions, and then outputs a prediction on these future cumulative rewards. So that is, it predicts whether the RL learning curve will rise, fall, or stay the same after the current trajectory. In general, a rising RL learning curve is a positive result because it means that you're getting closer to finding the highest performing policy. Falling RL learning curves suggest a decrease in performance. Um, and stagnating learning curves can mean one of two things. Either you have reached uh, the highest performing policy that you can, or you're stuck in local maximum. So uh, this problem, or so what CLEAR does is it predicts the sign of the slope of the learning curve rather than learning the resulting scalar cumulative reward. So we don't try to predict exactly what the cumulative reward is going to be. We just predict whether it's going to rise, fall, or stay about the same. Um, because predicting exactly what it needs to be would require regression is a much more difficult problem to solve and would take about the same length of time as learning the RL problem from start to finish. So we want to do something that's going, we're going to be able to learn quite a bit more quickly than the actual RL problem can be solved. So at the end of each trajectory, CLEAR trains this classifier as follows for each state action pair in some trajectory E that we just observed. So if the, cumulative, if the current cumulative reward is greater than the maximum seen cumulative reward, we train C with a rise label. We're seeing that these rewards are going up based on the state action pairs we observe in the trajectory. Otherwise, if the current cumulative reward is less than the maximum that we've seen, we train C with a falling label. Then otherwise, we're going to train C with a stagnate label. And we test this algorithm with simulated feedback. Um, this tested task is a robotics arm reaching towards a red object, this red ball here, um, over a 225 size. And so the robot's goal is to get that, that red ball. A blue object is added as a distractor here in varying locations. The robot receives a large reward if it reaches the true goal and a very small and a smaller reward if it reaches the distractor goal. And this creates kind of a local maxima for us to get out of. And what's happening here is I model human feedback by assuming that humans are giving optimal feedback for the robot reaching towards the blue distractor object. So robot's goal is red object, human's incorrect goal is blue object. And the distractor goal um, is placed in the locations shown by the orange dots in that figure right here. So here I show examples of different feedback models. In each one, the distractor object is in a different place. I also test when feedback is completely optimal for the correct goal object. That's the bottom right graph. I compared clear to policy shaping with multiple different trust settings, as well as Q-learning with no feedback whatsoever. Um, so the clear algorithm here is shown in blue, and then Q-learning is shown in orange. We find that unlike the varying policy shaping runs, which vary a lot based on which C you choose at the beginning, clear either matches or significantly outperforms Q-learning in all test cases. So there we're showing that clear is, is a more dependable choice than policy shaping if the feedback quality is unknown in advance. We're not saying that we outperform uh, policy shaving on every different scenario with any different C setting. 
But if we have someone come in, we've never learned from them before. We have no idea what kind of quality of feedback they're, they're doing. We have a better chance of learning well from them using clear than we do by randomly picking a C value. So we also ran an experiment on Amazon Mechanical Turk with a simulated robot and real human teachers. So I began with a robot pre-trained on simulated human feedback with uh, that single true and distractor goal object location. It's the same task here. I then showed participants four videos of the robot reaching towards the different objects with two different paths and recorded the participants' feedback. So here's the, the robot reaching towards either of the two distractor goals in, or the real goal or the distractor goal in two different paths. So prior to using CLEAR, the data was 57.5% correct. We trained on 100 classifier instances obtained by running the CLEAR algorithm 100 times. 65% of the kept feedback was classified correctly by the algorithm. And how our algorithm does this is if we predict that the, the uh, learning curve is rising and people are giving positive feedback to the robot, we trust that feedback, we keep it. If the uh, curve is falling and people are giving us good feedback, then we're not going to trust that so much. We are either going to discard it if we really don't trust it. Um, actually, sorry, we're going to flip it if we really don't trust it. So instead of it being positive feedback, it's going to go to negative feedback. And if we're unsure about it, we're just going to discard it. So there's kind of three options here. We can invert, keep, or discard. So what we saw here was that um, the algorithm did discard quite a bit of feedback determining that it's, it's of unknown quality. So this is can be when things are stagnating. This can be when it's dipping, the, the, the reward curve is dipping a little bit, but not a lot. Um, and there were a total of 120 instances of feedback collected on Amazon, Amazon Mechanical Turk. But over all 100 runs where we used that feedback, 3,420 feedback instances were discarded, while 8,580 were kept um, or inverted. So we are able to use a lot of that data that we're getting, even though we are discarding some of it. Even with less data, CLEAR was able to learn much more quickly than policy shaping here. CLEAR is uh, the blue performing algorithm. So to summarize, using CLEAR is more dependable than policy shaping and is able to classify human data fairly effectively. So that kind of covers the, the, the PhD work that I did on learning from incorrect teachers. Now that I'm at UW working as a postdoc with Sid Srinivasa, I'm really excited to continue working with robots learning from humans. So my main work that I do is on the assisted feeding project, which uses robotic arms to provide assistance with eating meals to those with upper extremity mobility impairments. And this is a system that several students and another postdoc have worked on, and I was lucky enough to start working on in September. Research in this project spans a very large learning space. So it's kind of an end-to-end -end system. There's quite a bit of work on vision and other sensing me methods, such as haptic context, which help us locate and classify bites of food and determine what kinds of skewering actions to use to pick up each bite to then be transferred to the person. So this is our bite acquisition work. This is a lot of sensing, a lot of perception, a lot of classification. Then once the food is acquired, we also research effective bite transfers or how to hand over the food to a human user. Um, sometimes uh, the users uh, with this project can move their head and neck. Sometimes they can't. We have to adapt to each different person who's using the system. And then my personal favorite branch of the research is the work on personalizing the assistive robot to the preferences of our end users. So what you can see here is a video uh, from prior work um, that focuses on how much autonomy the robot arm should have versus relying on input from users. So how much do they want to control how the robot arm functions? How much do they want it to just be a fully autonomous process that is out of their control um, but requires less effort? So what this, this research found, which was interesting, is that more robot autonomy is not always preferred. So this can vary based on the, the severity of the upper mobility impairment, um, but in general, people 
didn't really prefer, past a certain point, people didn't prefer more autonomy, the, the less autonomy in the robot. So furthering this work on personalization, I'm gonna be looking into methods for learning user preferences and improving byte transfer using different modalities of user feedback and trying to reduce the amount of feedback we need even further than I have. So since I'll still be working with human feedback, that's probably going to be imperfect at times, much like any other human feedback, I'm expecting that, that the work that I've been talking about will continue to expand. What I'm doing right now is a, a project to use minimal and easy to gather feedback from users for robots using reinforcement learning. So I'm still focusing in the space of human in the loop reinforcement learning. And this work is, is informed by prior work on learning from e-stop activations from users, from the work by Samuel Ainsworth cited here. Um, this prior work noted that when robots are learning using an MDP formulation, only including the states that are relevant or safe for the task for the robot to learn in can be an overstructured way to define the learning problem. So instead, robots can learn in a large state space, but also learn how to narrow down the state space to a subset called a support set using information from e-stops by human users. So in this case, let's assume that the robot is physically able to, to drive over the rug with no difficulty but the banana peel is a little too slippery. So we have the robot moving here, the user is fine, but stops them before they get to the banana peel. So that's an ESOP information that we can use to learn that we probably don't want to be traversing in this area over the banana peel. So that lets us narrow down our set of uh, states to learn from to areas that don't include that banana peel. So once the robot's been stopped, the robot will use the information to calculate the probability for visiting states based on that shortened trajectory. For the assisted feeding project, the end users of our robots have mobility impairments and will hopefully in the future use an arm like this one every day to eat. So they'll be using it a lot. So reducing the amount of feedback that the robots need to learn can be really helpful because it can get annoying providing a lot of feedback to a learning robot over time. Many of our end users are skilled with assistive technology that enables them to use phones and computers to give input to the robots. But just like any other robot teacher, we're expecting to see mistakes. So perhaps the e-stops will come at incorrect times based on misunderstandings of the robot's sensors or functions or through accidental button presses. So my current work is focused on how we can interpret incorrect e-stops in the setting as well as how much more information we can gather from people without adding too much burden. So right now, you know, just getting e-stops is great. If we can also get without too much difficulty why they press the e-stop or a scale of how badly the robot performed, that can really help us get a lot more information from the learning robot to help it learn more quickly. So some quick final thoughts before we switch over to, to, to Q&A. So, the research that I've talked about today is just a step towards robots interacting with real people in real environments. We expect our robots to be out working with people and interacting with them out in the wild. That means these robots are going to run into inexpert users, into imperfect users. People are good at teaching and interacting, but they're absolutely not perfect. Um, so my goal is for robots to be able to interact with and learn a task from any user they might come across outside of a lab setting and to make that experience more enjoyable and easy for the people interacting with the robots. Thanks so much to everyone, my, my former current lab mates, PIs, as well as everyone else that I, I obviously couldn't fit everyone on this slide. Um, but, and thank you all for, for coming today and listening. I'm excited to take questions. Thanks, Taylor. Bye. It was like great to hear you talk about your research. And I think we have now a few minutes for like uh, questions. Sure. Do you want to stop screen sharing for this or? I think you can let it be. It's, it's okay. okay. Maybe if someone asks questions in context, you can, you can go back. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if you have a question, feel free to like uh, unmute and ask, like speak up. But if you have issues with your mic, you can also type your question out in the chat. That way one of us can uh, read it to Taylor and have her answer it. Hey, Taylor. Freeland. Hi. I actually have a bunch of questions, but I'll just start <laughs> with one. Um, but like happy to let other people ask things. But if you need someone to fill the time, <laughs> I might be a person. Um, so I guess I'll start with a more general one that's 
that's more specific to your formulation, which is MDPs really assume that your full state space is observable, right? And I guess you already are currently more in your more current research, um, thinking about that a little bit more, uh, but often these problems are, are not well-structured, right? Totally. So do you have examples where uh, of certain domain applications where it's actually a not super well-structured environment? Because this leads into a, a secondary question on this specific topic, which there seems to be an oracle to the oracle, right? There's something uh, when you're doing your training sets that's saying this actually really is good feedback or this actually really is bad feedback, but ultimately, you know, you're focusing on this imperfect. So do you have any examples of um, domains that are a little bit less structured than you have told us so far? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would like to, to clarify too that we, so we are assuming that this, reward, like you said, we're assuming that that reward function is correct and we have some way to verify that the reward is correct, like you're saying. One thing that I was uh, very interested in doing and, and did throughout this research is it's always a sparse reward function. So it does, it's not shaped, it doesn't guide you through the state space. I'm looking at tasks where there is a defined end goal and that end goal can receive a reward. So once the robot is finished with the task, it will receive uh, a positive reward and otherwise it's just small negative rewards encouraging it to get to the goal as quickly as possible. So in order to define the reward function, you don't need to know that much about the state space except for the end state that you want the robot to be in. Um, now, however, to interact in an MDP, you still, you know, as the robot's moving through, you still need to be able to know when you're at that space, you need to be able to calculate the Q values back. So it still assumes that the, the state is observable in the robot, at least, um, but not necessarily all the way to that expert who defined the initial reward function. Um, I do think, um, you know, there's there's all kinds of robotics tasks that we look at that are not going to be fully defined. I mean, that's what, you know, partially observable MDPs are, are for. Um, and I think using POM DPs is a really possibly interesting um you know formulation and to, to look at for the problem um but it still observes that it assumes that someone can see it you know <laughs> it's, it's it's not fully unobservable um so yeah i mean i think especially like in the, the test i was looking at out in my phd i was looking at discrete state spaces but when you start to even just delve into continuous state spaces it's a lot harder it's a lot harder for people to see what changes are happening, um, even if the robot can. And I think that's that's a, a, a task space that can start to get into trouble with an MDP and learning from human teachers. And did that answer your your question or? Uh... Yeah, I'm trying to get you to push to, to like being a little bit more uh, concrete on almost like a practical application. Not that these aren't sure. practical, but I'm, um, I'm sort of trying to push that a little bit uh but but uh, yeah i i understand uh your act but like working in discrete space with a continuous domain so i'll leave it up to 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 others to ask but i'll i'll i'll, I'll add one more little snippet of what i was trying to get at yeah. which is um so i guess as someone who works a lot with people with disabilities yeah. i think like be a little careful using the words incorrect or imperfect and sort of sure. broaden this idea of what does it mean to give a good or bad example? Mm -hmm. How is the input actually being provided? Mm -hmm. And what happens if your teachers actually have disabilities since the caregiving robot ideally could help them uh, significantly? Absolutely. And um, we do want, we want the robot to personalize to the person. We don't want the person to have to, you know, change to, to the robot application as, exactly. as little as possible. And I think this stuff can be very interesting when you start thinking also in those broader terms. And like you're saying, discrete breakup of a continuous world, right? And then mm -hmm. how that's tailored with these different types of teachers. And so mm -hmm. I'm just curious, especially now with the feeding project, um, mm -hmm. maybe some examples of how you've had to change maybe the the input of feedback verbal versus nonverbal. Mm -hmm. could you talk to that a little bit and then i'll stop asking yeah yeah absolutely um so 
I think a lot of the input that we've been getting from people, we, we have used, uh, or not not me here, but working in the past, uh, they have used uh, verbal input, input from users, but it's not always desirable for the end users, especially when you're talking about social eating situations. You don't want to have to stop in your conversation that you're having with someone to tell the robot to do something differently or to give you a bite of food. Um, it's a lot easier if there's a less disruptive way to, to to talk to the robot. So we're you know working on more of an app application so that users can use their uh, devices that they already have control of, whatever cell phone, tablet, computer, um, to just button click in a quiet, unobtrusive manner to whatever conversations that they have going on, whatever they're doing. Um, so we want to make it we want to make it both easy for people and not disruptive to the eating experience because eating is a very social activity. Eating is, you know, you sometimes you're eating by yourself, sometimes you're eating with other people, sometimes you're eating and you're watching the TV and you don't want to have the arm get in the middle of you. You don't want to have, you know, you don't want to be talking over the TV. There's all sorts of scenarios where uh, we kind of have to change it and we have to we we as much as possible want to give different options to people so that they can choose which one to use at different times yeah um, and eating has also, to be a very personal experience as well absolutely absolutely um so i think that um and, and you know another option here is so we we do have uh, speaking to this observable space even just the the idea of trying to determine whether there is currently like whether the 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 acquisition of the food was successful or not that's something where we do have perception we do have tools to do it but they're not perfect they're not going to be completely reliable so if we're doing a reward function based on that getting that that goal information is going to be very difficult if we don't have a person in the loop, the user, to confirm or deny whether the food was actually picked up off the plate. So that is a scenario where I absolutely would not want to use the the words incorrect or you know anything like that because that's going to be completely. It is. It's a lot of it's dependent on the user, and we can kind of double check. And say you know, oh I you know I, I don't see food. I do see food. Whatever. But in the end, we're going to defer to the user. Sometimes I think I think you're right. I definitely have to be very careful with using imperfect, incorrect. It's more um, with all people using the robot. This is outside of the feeding task. It's misunderstanding the robot's function versus understanding it and being clear. So what I'm I'm seeing here is that this robot arm is it's weirdly shaped. They look like alien arms. They're not like it's you can't one to one map the human joints to the robot joints. So if you're someone who's been using this robot for a really long time, you're going to be totally, you're going to have very few misunderstandings. But if you are just first sitting down with this, sometimes the way that the robot has to move itself to get into the position that you want it to be in is not what you would think, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so kind of doing a, a little bit of back and forth on we want to personalize the person we're going to listen to what they they want and learn to do that but sometimes the way that the robot moves while still feeling okay to the user is slightly unexpected and we want to be able to kind of close that gap yeah great very interesting work thank you so much thank you and also thank you for clarifying on being careful with with uh, imperfect and everything i i Definitely, you know, that that's something where I, I want to be make sure that I'm saying it in a clear way and uh, actually actually talking about what our users want and, and what we're trying to do. Do you have any more questions? Well, in that case, I'd actually want to ask you a question. Uh, this okay. one is a little bit more uh, general and not specific to your work per se, but um, when you're looking at like adapting personal care robots to users, and I imagine that'll be more in like a, a very uh, 
like personal setting like at a user's house or something like that and not mm -hmm. in an institution where you would go in yeah. and train your robot right so when you do that like uh, how significant is like uh, moving things away from online learning and online evaluation like is is it relevant to like to off policy evaluation or even like offline learning uh, because like, yeah. most of the work i've been reading is about like uh, doing things with the robot online Sure, absolutely. I think we want a nice mix of that because mm -hmm. I think ideally what we would see is as much learning as we can do offline as we can, the better because we want these to be functional, you know, as, as close to soon as we deploy them in someone's house and, and have someone using it as we can. We want, we want it to be out of the box working. What we want online learning for is more on the side of personalization. So it's more on the side of comfort for users when they like how they want the robot arm approaching them how do they want um the the robot tech what kind what size bites do they want the robot to pick up from the plate there's all these sorts of things that we can do as much learning as we want to offline but everyone you know uh like uh Brilin was saying it, it's a personal you're eating is such a personal experience and everyone has a different way if you put 500 people in a room together and had them eat one meal, I doubt they'd all eat it the same way. We're going to eat things in different orders. We're going to eat different bite sizes. We're going to want to talk versus not talk. There are just it, so many ways that that the eating experience can be different. And we want to make sure that as close that we get as close as we can to how a human caregiver would be feeding them in that situation, but just to take some of the the burden off of the caregiver and also um make the you know the, the users have give them more independence um when they're you know eating um so we want we want to be able to obviously it's not going to replace caregivers um but we want to supplement that as as closely as possible All right thank you Yeah, I think in that case, uh, we can like uh, end the uh, talk. And if you have any more questions, you can like uh, probably join our Slack channel and continue our discussion in the future. And we'd also be sharing uh, Taylor's uh, recordings on YouTube and uh, our podcasts uh, for you to like catch up later. And yeah, thank you for joining and thanks Taylor for talking. I hope uh, everyone else had a, like a nice opportunity to find out about your research as well. And in a couple of weeks, we have our next session again. We have Mikol Spitale joining us, and uh, they're going to be talking about work on human robot interaction for uh, assessing and promoting mental well being. So, thank you all for joining today, and hope you have a good day. Mm -hmm.